If you put a frog in a pot of water and start to heat the water until it boils, the frog will slowly get accustomed to the temperature until the boiling water kills it. The point is that the frog won't realise it's in danger until it's too late. That's quite a big question. <laughs> That's quite a big question. Um, you just simplify it. As much as possible. Yeah. yeah um, there are a variety of different surveillance powers that the government has, and they range from what we would think of as relatively traditional surveillance nowadays, um, say a targeted interception power, which is the ability of them to go into um, someone they suspect of committing a crime, for instance, and listen to their phone conversations uh, under a specific warrant for that person. What we've learned over the last few years is now that that type of surveillance power can range all the way out to the ability to, for instance, tap into these very large cables that carry all of our internet communications and collect all of them and then filter through them to see what may be of interest. So nowadays when you talk about surveillance, it's quite a wide range. Is it actually the, the contents of what you're saying as well? Yes, so the c communication itself, the full communication includes both the content and what we would sometimes call the metadata. So the metadata is who you're talking to, when you sent that, com that message, um, what sort of service you're using to send it, and perhaps where you're located at the time, doing, especially if you're using your mobile phone when you're sending that communication. So that's what we t generally think of the metadata. The content is actually what you're writing in the message. Hey Sam, how are you doing today? And they have powers to collect both of those in place. Both powers, whether or not you call them mass surveillance, by their nature mean that you are collecting the information from many, many people and you don't have a suspicion as to each one of those people you're collecting information from that they actually might be committing a crime or might be a threat to national security. And those bulk powers are written so broadly in the law right now and have, we understand, been used so broadly to mean that almost anyone could be subject to that surveillance. Then we also know that in practice, when they're doing things like tapping into those cables that I was talking about, they're actually collecting a lot of information at the same time. Um, we've heard of arguments from people like Amon that maybe they don't read every single piece of that information, but I think it's very problematic to be collecting it to the first place because you, you then have the feeling um, that you are under surveillance and that we are all be tre being treated as suspects. If I was to tell you that in my breast pocket I have uh, your personal diary, I have all your passwords uh, to all of the, you know, your phone, your email account, etc. But I promise I won't look at it ever. Is that sufficient? Does that mean that I'm not intruding in your, into your privacy? I don't think it does mean that. I think that's actually a real violation of your rights. I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. The former NSA contract employee who exposed two of the government's top secret surveillance programs 
one that collected the phone records of millions of Americans, and the other that monitored internet traffic. The information that, that he has disclosed is, is the highest level of national security. It's undermined public confidence in the government and led to a number of diplomatic scandals. U.S. officials don't know how much other classified information he has. Leaks revealed that the U.S. and the U.K. were involved in secret surveillance programs. Far from rolling back, um, the, some of the mass surveillance that Edward Snowden has revealed, the fear is that they might be going further, that they might be asking for even more powers. Uh, for many people, it's scary how capable they are. Prison um, exposed by Edward Snowden, and this, is, this was the, um, the sharing agreement between NSA and GCHQ, which was found to be unlawful. It's not unlawful. It was not found to be unlawful, quite the reverse. Some have said that all of the decisions have never found that the intelligence agencies have been acting unlawfully. Um, and that's just untrue. The uh, independent court the examined... Headline, for example, the headlines that we see in the media, for example, GCHQ found to be unlawful for seven years by the investigation yeah, yeah. powers. That's the kind of misleading uh, headline that I think is irresponsible journalism. Because what you've got to do is get out the court judgment and read it. Up until the release of information in the IPT, there was an illegal intelligence sharing relationship between the US and the UK. That is a marker there that there is an independent tribunal that has looked at this situation, a situation that we would have no understanding of unless it was for Snowden. And they've said, this is unlawful. This has gone too far. Without Snowden, we wouldn't necessarily see this reform that we're seeing in the UK now with the Investigatory Powers Bill. We wouldn't necessarily see the um, Intelligence Security Committee in the UK really doing their job. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and with permission, I would like to make a statement about the draft Investigatory Powers Bill. In the past 12 months alone, six significant terrorist plots have been disrupted here in the UK, as well as a number of further plots overseas. The frequency and cost of cyber attacks is increasing, with 90% of large organisations suffering an information security breach last year. And the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Command estimate that there are 50,000 people in this country downloading indecent images of children. It cannot be right that today the police could find an abducted child if the suspects were using mobile phones to coordinate their crime, but if they were using social media or communications apps, then they would be out of reach. Mr Speaker, the legislation we are proposing today is unprecedented. It will provide unparalleled openness and transparency about our investigatory powers, it will provide the strongest safeguards and world-leading oversight arrangements, and it will give the men and women of our security and intelligence agencies and our law enforcement agencies the powers they need to protect our country. What the new bill does is get judges involved for the first time. And what people wanted, and what um, David Anderson QC, the Independent Reviewer of Terrorism legislation recommended, was that judicial warrants should be the main way to do it. What's actually been suggested is what they call a double lock process, whereby the Home Secretary still authorises the warrant, but gets a kind of a check over by the... the, the um, judges. Do you go to a judge and say, we can't possibly tell you why we need this warrant because it's a matter of national security, but we need it? <laughs> or do you have a better level of scrutiny than that? You know, do, do you have secret courts where the defendant can't see the evidence um, presented against them because, of its, because it's an issue of national security or not? You know, it's, it's not the, the principle of a warrant, which I agree is a good thing to be imposed. It's, it's how that warrant um, and that oversight system works. Um, and also, I'm not sure that they should be congratulated for coming clean about what they do. 
and having to, you know, and, and saying, you know what, we're just going to we're going to play by the rules from now on, but we're going to write the terms of the rules. I would very much like to see a, 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 a very formal, very, very independent role for the judiciary uh, or for the judicial commissioner in signing off on warrants. I don't really want to see a Home Secretary say, this is what we're going to do. Are you all right with that? And for the for the for the judge to say, oh, well, yes, of course. Or if they say no, for it to then go over their head as the as the bill, the IP draft bill uh, implies. But I'm very strongly opposed to having a member of the judiciary code, making a co-decision. That is really dangerous. What happens if it goes wrong? Who's to blame? Who comes before Parliament? Do the, who, do the, who do the relatives uh, sue if a bomb's gone off and a Secretary of State had made a valid decision with, under difficult circumstances with imperfect information but it had been skittled by a very well-meaning, very well-trained judge on a legal nicety. There needs to be, for clarity and for comprehension, there needs to be a, a very standard approach for this is what happens with the police, this is what happens with the intelligence agencies, and no one should be marking their own homework. Um, it's, it's basically hacking or the installation of malware or what? You might, what the NSA calls implants and what we call you know, remote administration tools in a machine. So um, if I'm a bad person, the police would be able to say, hey, uh, Mr. O2 put a, an update to the Android on Professor Anderson's phone, and that would enable them remotely to turn it on, to use it as a microphone, to use it as a room bug, to look at me through the camera, to collect my location history and all the rest of it. What's more, um, as we get digital stuff in more and more devices. They could do the same to um, my granddaughter's Barbie doll, they could do the same to your car, they could do the same to your electricity meter. Um, it is open season on the Internet of Things. There's a very good example of when this has been done in the past by the intelligence agencies, uh, which was revealed in the Edward Snowden papers. It's called Optic Nerve. That was when GCHQ here in the UK and NSA in America switched on Yahoo users' webcams and took a photograph of them every five minutes having a private conversation. They were looking for terrorist activity, but what they actually found was a lot of people naked chatting away and doing things that people do when they think they're having a private conversation behind a closed door. They're asking for the ability to get a warrant that doesn't necessarily say, I'm, I think Tom has committed a crime, I want to go look at Tom's computer to find evidence of the crime. They want to get a warrant that says, I think that someone in Birmingham has committed a crime. I want you to give a warrant so that I could go hack into anyone's computer in Birmingham because I need a little more time or I somehow need to figure out who that person is going to be. So trust me to decide who in Birmingham might be a suspect. I think they're all suspects at the moment, so you need to give me the power to go use this extraordinary power to hack into our computer. There are concerns about the bulk capabilities. The idea that bulk personal data sets haven't been defined in any way, shape or form and could potentially impact every single person in this country, whether uh, under suspicion or not. Um, and more broadly, bulk interception, bulk equipment interference, th these are powers that we argue should be targeted. And when I say targeted, I mean on a person, on a place, not on a group, not on a, a broad area, but on specifics, rather than accessing everybody, filtering it through to try and pick out the, the, the needles from the haystack. They want to hold some of the data, but they also want to make companies hold on to some of their own data so that should the government need it, rather than going to their own great big evil database down in Cheltenham, they can just say, excuse me Facebook, give us this information. We know you're keeping it because we told you you must. Now. Um, let us have access to it. They believe that it's important. Um, now, whether they have uh, provided the operational case to a level that is sufficient to say that it's important to, over to oversight regimes like the uh, Intelligence Security Committee, um, that's another question. And in fact, the recent statement by the Intelligence Security, Security Committee specifically said the operational case has not necessarily been made for some of these powers. 
it's of course always going to be about interpretation. Somebody is going to come to um, the prime minister or or the home secretary and say, "We have a need for these kind of for these kind of powers. Um, we have a need because we are um, we are falling behind on X, Y, and Z." But how how you hold that to account to truly look and see whether or not that is a a truly proportionate measure? Is there not a less intrusive measure that can be used? Is it truly um, necessary to achieve the ends that they're trying to achieve? Um, but this is a massive opportunity, not just for us, but for all members of the public to ask that question of themselves and possibly even engage in that debate, asking their MP, do you think this is a proportionate measure? Uh, Rebecca's got more details for us here in the studio because it appears now that it may not just be one location. These were the first victims of six simultaneous attacks. A second blast threw the crowd into panic. At the Bataclan concert hall, more shootings and an ongoing hostage crisis. I want to believe that we're not going to live in a world of fear. I don't want friends to, to become this uh, a security uh, place. Uh, uh. Paris is still hurting from three days of terror in January, which left 17 people dead, 12 of them shot at the offices of Charlie Hebdo. In a, in a free society, you cannot uh, secure every restaurant, every concert venue, uh, every, every football game. And if we have thousands of people that are inspired by a certain ideology and ready to commit an act of violence, one cannot, just a matter of capabilities, of resources, one cannot monitor all these people 24-7. New details show how many of the ISIS suspects were known to authorities before taking part in the Paris attacks. You see that the intelligence services of the world claim that it is because of encryption, but the evidence has come out that, in fact, the attacks in Paris were perpetrated by people who used credit cards in their real name, who used unencrypted text messages to say things like, let's go. No one is asking how it is that they are doing arms trafficking. Those are physical goods that do not travel through the Internet. How is it the case that the intelligence services have failed so badly and that they seek instead to distract and to counter-accuse and to suggest encryption, things that people don't understand, that encryption is the issue? If an event happens, you need to be able to go back and look at what these individuals were doing, who they were communicating with, what they were saying, so that you uh, can then keep people safe in future. You know what they're doing, you can exploit their networks, you can exploit the way they work, so that it improves your understanding and ultimately keeps people safe. And a part of that will be that bulk collection and keeping things on record for a year, which is what the, the new bill does. But it's not... The key thing with this legislation, I'm afraid, is that if you're not doing anything wrong, you've got nothing to worry about. You have to message. you have to ask the French. My impression is that they are catching up with Britain. with Britain because of the importance of having this kind of intelligence. Why do you think, you know, in the last twelve months, seven attacks in the UK itself were stopped? It was because of good intelligence work. Well, uh, I think you in the UK should ask for proof of that. Because we did in NSA, when Alexander and a head of NSA said in the Senate Judiciary Committee that he's, his, this program stopped 54 attacks inside the U.S., the Judiciary Committee challenged him to prove it. He came out proving zero of them. 
So I think you need to have uh, some proof. You can't just you can't trust what your government saying. Is basically what I'm saying. David Anderson QC, the Independent Reviewer, persuaded GCHQ to let him publish two annexes to his report, in which he listed a number of cases, both criminal cases and terrorism cases, where the bulk access had made a difference. Sure. Let's go through them. Yeah. Sometimes, because of international nature of Al Qaeda inspired terrorism, bulk data is the first and last line of defense. Wait a minute. Let's stop right there. <laughs> it's international. You know they're Al Qaeda. You're targeting them. Whoever they connect with, you target. Okay? Okay. That's the targeted approach. Now continue. <laughs> In, in 2010, an intelligence operation identified a plot which came right from the top of Al-Qaeda to send out waves of operatives to Europe to act as sleeper cells and pre prepare waves of attacks. That's the whole point. Right. You were targeting them. You get that as it happens. You don't have to collect the rest of the world to get that. That's my point. Okay. So, in, in a word, like all of these... Here's I can tell. That's what I've seen, yeah. Could it... As, sorry, so... Targeting could have gotten them, yes. I see. Okay, rather than the bulk. Yeah, and you save about 99% of the cost. In an ideal world, if, if GCHQ and all the in intelligence agencies could look out there and go, right, we know everyone who's in ISIS, we know everyone who's in Al-Qaeda, we know who, what communications of ISIS is using, we, we, we're all over them, then you obviously wouldn't require bulk data to deal with those threats. But the thing that I think Bill's missing from that argument is that you need to discover new targets and you need to discover communications devices used by the targets you know about. So I think in some of the scenarios that he talks about, they are known individuals or known groups, but there's a sort of chicken and egg scenario of like how, how do we know who we're interested in? How do we know what communications devices they are? You can't just pluck intelligence from the internet in a really specific targeted way all the time. In an ideal world, Yes, you'd have a human agent who would go, this is the guy you need to be worried about. Here's his phone number. Brilliant. But the reality of modern day communications, the challenges of encryption of people using multiple devices, of not always having access to everything you need at the, at the right time, is that sometimes you need to go and look across a bigger data set and go, we know the patterns we're looking for, we know who we're looking for, but we just don't have that specific endpoint. I don't think that anyone can really argue that, it, that you can't deal with some of this with mass surveillance. You can. You can, as you say. You will, if you gather enough data, there will be some paedophiles, terrorists and so on in it. If you gather everything, of course they're there. But is it the most efficient way to catch them? Is, it, is the collateral damage of this method different from the collateral damage of another method? Have we considered alternatives? Because, again, if we go back to the, the terrorist events, particularly the Charlie Hebdo one, mm -hmm. the two Charlie Hebdo shooters had been under surveillance by the French authorities. They were known to the French authorities. And they dropped the surveillance on the two because of lack of resources. So they stopped watching them in conventional terms while they were spending more and more money on electronic mass surveillance. It would be wrong for us to use Paris as, as, as a reason to say, shut it all down. It's much more important to look forward to say, what is the society that we're now willing to create? And what, is the, what are the measures that we want to institute? And how much further are we willing to go, um, if at all? What's the worst case scenario? Well, you look at all kinds of examples of people who you think would be, an uh, example, you know, a doctor who's working in, in uh, East Africa who suddenly finds out that their communications are being, are being read and being noticed. Um, there's, there's a fundamental principle, right? There's, there is, you know, the right to privacy, your human rights, the kind of legal and ethical frameworks under which the society in which we live, right? That's one thing. Um, on a more practical level, what if you're wrongly accused of something? You know, what if you... Uh, what if you're suspected of a crime that you didn't commit, or um, somebody uh, has an interest or reason to, to accuse you of a crime and might want to frame you? Or, um, I mean, I know this all sounds slightly paranoid and conspiracy theory, but 
you know, there, there are all kinds of, of miscarriages of justice in the system at the moment. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that you get, if you, if you get to a place where you give one organisation or one person or one body too much power, they have the power to abuse it. That's, I mean, it sounds slightly vague, but does it not sound spooky? <laughs> Where are we going? We are going to the mining place by Tower Hill to go visit a human rights lawyer, Kat Craig, from an organisation called Reprieve. Try and uncover some victims of surveillance. These are two Libyan men. They were opponents of the Gaddafi regime. And they were respectively in Malaysia and Hong Kong with their families. Abdul Hakim with his five month pregnant wife, Sami with his wife and four children, all under the age of 12. Um, and they were picked up in an illegal operation between the CIA and Britain's MI6. Uh, they were illegally kidnapped and taken back to Gaddafi's Libya, where they were unlawfully imprisoned and horrifically tortured. I was hung by my wrist from a wall and severely beaten. I was often blindfolded. Loud music was blasted at me. It's bad enough that I was tortured. I still don't understand why my wife was mistreated as well. Both Abdul Hakim and Sami uh, were ultimately released and they sought to bring a case against the British government for their part in their kidnap, uh, their rendition back to Libya, and their complicity in the torture that they then suffered for roughly six years. That case is ongoing, but what's become clear as a result of the revelations that Snowden made was that the spying programmes that Britain was implementing were also being used potentially to suck up information between these men and their lawyers that was entirely confidential, where the government shouldn't be accessing that information because if it did, it wouldn't be dealing with issues of national security. It wouldn't be using that information to protect us because there was no national security value to it. Instead, that information could be used and abused to gain an unfair advantage in this incredibly potent and damning case against the British government. In other words, these men were trying to seek justice through British courts and the government was abusing its power of surveillance to gain an insight into the private conversations between these men and their lawyers. We hope the new Libya, freed from its dictator, will have positive relationships with the West, but this relationship must be based on respect and justice. In my experience, in practice, the government systemically seeks to use either legal ploys or gaining unfair advantage, for example, through spying on, on privileged communications to evade accountability and immunise itself from criticism. I have to question one example, yeah. though, um, which maybe you can clear up for me if it's not quite correct, but this comes from a direct personal source of someone who was a member, actually a few members, of a grassroots political group called Brick Lane Debates. They're activists, they're anti-austerity, um, and their communications data was surveyed and intercepted, and police forces knew that they were going to attend, indeed probably lead, a march, and were sent letters prior to that march and they have pictures of this letter saying that if you leave your house on a specific day, if you go within the vicinity of where this march is going to be assembled, you will be arrested. That seems to go against every democratic right that we should have in the UK. I've no idea about the case. I've never heard of it. But I think it's a perfectly fair point you're making. It's got nothing to do with the intelligence agencies. 
because that would be outside their legal remit. So you're talking about police activity. And really what you're saying is... But it's the same data that's being used, yeah, whether it's an yeah, but this or whether isn't, it's isn't this, it's still yes, authority. Isn't, isn't this the point that we're agreeing, because of the kind of cases I've mentioned, that these techniques have to be available to law enforcement, particularly to the police. And there are very good reasons why the public would want them available. What you're saying is that some police operations are not properly justified. Now, I've, that may well be true. There have been some scandals recently, certainly. Uh, and that's a policy debate about, you know, the police, com the police complaints uh, commission can look into. It's about the policing commissioners and have they got uh, the right kind of influence over their local constabulary. It's about whether the Home Office is keeping a proper eye on the National Crime Agency, for example, and the Mayor of London on the uh, Metropolitan Police. But that's not a debate about whether these powers should exist and these capabilities should exist. It's simply saying you don't like the way the police behave against certain kinds of groups, and that's a perfectly respectable thing to say, and a lot of people would agree with it. As long as you have these powers, there will be some element or some people who will no doubt misuse them. Well, I come to this from a historical perspective, first of all. Right now, uh, as a white middle-class woman living in London, I'm not really of any great suspicion. Okay, my job might throw me into some shining light, but, but really I can go about my business and I don't have to watch my back too hard. If I were a Muslim woman in Britain right now, I might feel very, very differently. My religion is one that's at odds with, uh, with, with a large part of uh, the world, is how it's perceived, I'm not saying that's accurate. To be private then, in that instance, it's almost the same as the Hutu and the Tutsis line or the Jew line during the Second World War, that just for one moment in time, if your face doesn't fit, then you are a target. Privacy is important in that, in that aspect. It, it, that, that sounds very convoluted, it sounds very uh, complex way of trying to explain it. But at some point, the light is always shone on a member of society, even if you are completely innocent of any wrongdoing. Now that we know about this, it has uh, courts have ruled it unlawful. They've said that despite the fact that it's been operating since September 11th, from the very first day, it was against the law. It was a violation of basic constitutional rights. Uh, the White House did a classified investigation of it and they found that it had never stopped a single terrorist attack. Despite the reality that this program was considered ineffective and illegal by every branch of government, Spies, security agencies, and their representatives in Congress argued that it should remain. They said, but, but terrorism. You know, they, they played the terrorism card. They said, people will die if we lose this program, despite the fact that the court says that's never been the case, despite the fact that the White House says that's never been the case. We need to keep it anyway. And yet, for the first time in 40 years of U.S. history, since the intelligence community was re reformed in the 70s, uh, we found that facts have become more persuasive than fear. For the first time in recent history, we found that despite the claims of government, the public made the final decision. And that is a radical change that we should seize on, we should value, and we should push further. If you truly believe that something hasn't been justified, we have to say it, and we have to say it loudly, and we have to say it so it can be heard, 
so that either that justification can be made and we can truly understand why these powers are required, or they roll them back. We cannot just allow it to pass by um, blindly and then into law. If you put a frog in a pot of water and start to heat the water until it boils, the frog will slowly get accustomed to the temperature until the boiling water kills it. The point is that the frog won't realise it's in danger until it's too late.